Thank you so much for joining us today for Fielding Graduate University's Virtual Open House Series, Part 3, Funding Your Education. At today's Part 3, again, all about funding your education. If you weren't able to join us live for Part 1, all about fielding, or Part 2, application tips, the recordings are available on our website. It is so great to have so many of you here live for part three. And for those unable to attend live, we will be recording today's presentation. So for recording purposes, please be sure to mute your microphones, turn off your videos, and remember to type any questions that come up during the presentation in the chat box. We'll be sure to cover your questions at the end of the presentation. So with that said, let's get started. Today's presenters include myself, Caroline Wetterburn, Fielding Senior Admissions Advisor, and Amanda Green, our Assistant Director of Financial Aid and Scholarships. Uh, we understand funding your education is a big factor in beginning a graduate program, and we want to ensure you have all the information you need to make an informed decision. In today's presentation, Amanda will be providing important information to help us better understand the costs associated with graduate studies at Fielding. She'll also cover the various funding options students use, information about the free application for federal student aid, which many of you know is the FAFSA, and I'll explain the next steps you can take from here. And throughout the presentation, again, be sure to type your questions in the chat so we can address them at the end. Now, Amanda, would you start us off by sharing what's included in the cost of attendance at Fielding? Uh, yes, so the cost of attendance or the COA budget, uh, it's used to calculate need eligibility um, for certain scholarships and for a little bit of funding, um, which could be you know, loans, uh, external funding <clears throat> and grants within just one year. Um, it is not the amount that will be billed to you, so you're not going to be charged for some of those items that are listed there. The only thing you'll be charged is tuition and fees. So like the books and supplies, we don't charge. We don't charge a room um, and board or personal expenses or transportation, anything like that. Um, those, we just put together those numbers to give students an idea of how much they can expect to spend on books and supplies and their own personal room and board um, and expenses and the like. Um, and we do calculate it for each program. Um, and when you do receive an award letter, so if you do decide to apply for financial aid and you receive an award letter, um, you will see the, these numbers uh, pop up in there. And then of course you can find our uh, COA details uh, up on our financial aid and scholarships page um, on the fielding website. Uh, and it will break down for each program as well there. So uh, how it's calculated is, again, it's, it's based upon your program. Uh, most of our programs are um, a flat rate tuition. So it doesn't matter how many credits or units or whatever you like to call them um, uh, you take, it'll just be the same charge. Um, also too, for full-time versus half-time for financial aid, uh, students must be enrolled in at least half time to receive um, in-school deferment. So if you have previous student loans to have those be put on pause while you're attending um, and also to be eligible to continue to receive uh, federal student loans while you are attending. So at least half time. Um, the, if there is any change in your uh, cost of attendance based on your full-time or your half-time status. Um, and if you are in one of the credit-based programs, we will do a recalculation and we would just work with you then um, with whatever ends up popping up. Um, if you uh, are attending full-time or half-time, that usually doesn't change the extra things that you could receive, such as the funding for the books and supplies or room and board it just changes the amount of tuition. Um, and if you needed extra funding beyond just the tuition and fees, uh, you can request extra funding for books and supplies to help you know, supplement 
um, what you might be putting out also to for room and board and transportation. Um, but again, the only thing that the school is going to be charging is the tuition and uh, whatever applicable fees. Now that we've covered a little bit about the cost of attendance, let's continue with what type of funding options are available. So Amanda, would you tell us about fielding right. scholarships for incoming students and what other opportunities there are for future terms? So there are a few um, scholarships that are available to our incoming students and um, you don't have to do anything separate to apply for them. So as soon as you um, get accepted, you're automatically considered for those incoming student scholarships um, and you would be notified to before the start of your, your program if you were to receive one. Um, and those generally can range from 1,000 to 3,000 um, for in each scholarship and it would be applied to your first term of tuition only. Um, so it's just for that first term, it's not split up across the, the year. Um, while you continue though through the program, Program, we do open what we call a common scholarship application each term. Um, so there are new scholarships available every term. Um, and we send out a notification to all of our, you know, currently enrolled students, letting them know when it's open, you have a month to complete the common scholarship application and submit any um, extra documents at that time. So most of those do require a uh, letter of recommendation or or a personal statement slash essay. Um, and each one uh, will notify you which items you need. Um, and you have a month to submit all those documents. Um, once they are submitted, we send them off, the financial aid office will send them off to the scholarship committees, they'll be reviewed, they'll make their decisions. And then within about two to three weeks, we, from when the application closes, we notify students that they've received one. Um, and those can range from anywhere from $500 for the year, you know, for that term um, to approximately $10,000. It just depends um, on what program you're in, when the scholarship's available to you. Um, most of our scholarships do open up to students later on in their programs, not very early, uh, mainly because our donors do like to see, uh, you know, the type of research our students are doing and they like to help fund uh, the research portion. So you'll see a lot more open up if you move into, you know, your dissertation phase or uh, research writing and things like that. Um, Thanks, Amanda. Um, could you share more about seeking scholarships outside of fielding? Yes. So we do have some links uh, posted out on our uh, page, on our scholarships page to help students find outside sources. Um, when you are looking for outside sources, we recommend that you kind of that you look at something that might be more um, for you and not just for your program or the research that you're uh, planning on doing. So, for example, like I've seen students receive, you know, like a cancer survivor scholarship or even a left handed scholarship. Um, some students get uh, scholarships or grants for single you know, parent households um, and things like that. So I said definitely look for something that might support your research, but don't just limit it to that. Uh, we also have a few things out there too for um, links for travel benefits, uh, links to you know, like military.com and VA websites also to find extra funding for um, possibly if you are a child of a veteran or um, a spouse as well. So there are different uh, things. However, for all of those, you would apply directly to that organization. Um, and if you know, and you submit all your documents to them directly, and if you are awarded, some of them pay the student directly. So some may just send you a check. Um, others will pay the school in your name. And if that happens, it would go through our student accounts office. And then as soon as the funds are received, they would apply it directly uh, towards your student statement. And for those, um, obviously, you know, they, since it's through different organizations, they all have different deadlines. Um, for the majority of them, a good amount open in the spring. Um, so you'd want to be, you know, taking a look at those maybe around like March or April. Um, their deadlines generally fall around like May or June to then be applied to your fall um, funding. 
Thank you for all of that helpful information regarding scholarships inside and outside of fielding. Would you tell us more about what other funding options are available? So of course there's, you know, personal resources if you can, um, you know, afford to pay tuition, uh, the monthly payment plan is perfect. You can just, you know, set up that, that it's a $50 fee to begin with. And then it's, I believe the student accounts office divides it by uh, term. Um, and then you can do payment plans with the student accounts office. Um, for veterans benefits, the very first step is just getting um, a copy of your certificate of eligibility and submitting that to our registrar's office. Um, our registrar's office processes all of our um, VA uh, funding. So if you have, you know, chapter 33 or 31 of, uh, or sorry, 35, um, or even if you have, you know, voc rehab and I believe the VA's just recently changed. It's not VA Voc Rehab anymore. Um, they did change the name of it, but it still falls under the same chapter number uh, as it did previously. So if you get your certificate of eligibility, send it into the registrar's office, they'll review it and confirm your eligibility and provide you with numbers. Um, the VA does set a year amount term, um, or sorry, cost that they uh, pay out per year and that is established on August 1st um, as to how much that would be. For our international students, there are a few, you know, Canadian student loans. Um, there's, you know, a few different scholarships also that are available. We have a bunch of links uh, listed out on our website for students to take a look at to see, um, you know, exactly from which area you're coming from as to what might be available. Um, there's also a few private loan options for uh, international students as well. Um, so for employer benefits, uh, you know, just go to your, your HR office um, and see, of course, what do they offer? Um, for some students, they do tuition reimbursement and that's the biggest one that we've seen. So a good amount of our students, you know, they either take out student loans or they pay out of pocket um, for their tuition and then their work ends up reimbursing them after they could either provide um, you know, proof of enrollment and registration or proof of grades earned. Um, another would be tuition assistance from your employer. Some may pay fully after you are registered in your classes. Others uh, may, you know, only support half or something, but you would just need to go to your, uh, your HR office to see what is available to you. Great. And another funding option I know includes uh, federal student loans. Amanda will be sharing important information about these loans as well as the process for applying for them. Yes. So for the federal student loans, um, some of you may be familiar if you have used them in the past for your undergrad. Um, at the graduate level, there's two uh, main student federal student loans that are available. It's the unsubsidized uh, Stafford Direct Loan and the Graduate Plus Loan. Um, the unsubsidized loan is applied, you can apply for that one through the FAFSA, uh, which I mentioned a bit earlier and we'll talk about uh, in a little bit coming up too. But uh, this one is similar to what you may have seen again too in your undergrad. Um, however, it's going to be $20,500 per academic year, per award year, uh, is the max unless you're in the clinical program. Uh, then it is a bit higher um, because it's a, they consider, you know, a medical degree. So Department of Ed allows for higher borrowing. Um, the lifetime limit, so the max that a student can receive uh, in an aggregate limit is that 138500 and this does include uh, previous student loans. So if you have any subsidized or unsubsidized student loans from the past, um, it would be calculated into this. Uh, once you reach that Max, you can still receive funding from the Graduate Plus loan. Uh, so don't worry too. <laughs> like, it is a hard limit, but there is still options after that. Um, the current interest rate is at a 5.28. Uh, and of course, there's a loan origination fee. The unsubsidized loans is through the FAFSA, and it's a free uh, application for that. It does not do a credit check. Um, once you do graduate, rate or, uh, you know, leave your program, um, you do enter into a six-month grace period on any of those loans that you took out while you were attending. 
Uh, so you have six months to set up any payment arrangements with your uh, loan servicer. Um, they do have income-based repayment plans available. There's a, a slew really of uh, repayment options. Uh, you would just be communicating with your uh, servicer to set up whichever one works best for you. Um, when you are coming to the end of your program, uh, a lot of our students do set up uh, appointments with either myself or Lillian, our financial aid director, to just discuss um, what some of the repayment options are uh, at that time. So, you know, I mean, just to have a little bit more information before you hit uh, that six month grace period um, and then have to start uh, speaking with you, your uh, loan servicers. So the direct uh, graduate plus loan, it is a supplemental student loan. Like I said, you could use it if you hit that 138,500 to fully fund your tuition, or if the 20,500 doesn't completely cover your tuition. You can then borrow also from the Graduate PLUS loan to do a combination of the two loans to fully fund um, your tuition. This is also the loan that you could use to help um, cover some of the other fees, or not fees, but some of the other expenses uh, that you might incur, like we talked about in the cost of attendance. So if you needed extra funding for books and supplies or room and board or transportation for um, your program or research, this is uh, the loan that you can apply for to receive that extra funding. Um, there is no limit on this, like the lifetime maximum. There is no limit um, set as of yet by Department of Education. Um, so it's really just going to be based off of your cost of attendance as to how much you could receive uh, from the Graduate PLUS loan. The Graduate PLUS loan um, does require a credit check. The Department of Education runs the credit check. It's just a soft credit check. They don't look at, you know, your FICO score or your anything like that. They don't look at any of those. Um, what they are looking at, though, is the last five years worth of credit history uh, to see if you've had any major defaults, such as a foreclosure or a bankruptcy, um, or if you've defaulted on any previous student loans. Those are really the only reasons why a student may be denied. Um, if you are denied, of course, we will work with you as to what your options are. The main two options are either appealing the decision um, and sending in documentation to Department of Education. Um, another would be, you know, receiving a, uh, an endorser, so a co-signer um, for your loan. But uh, this one also falls under, um, since it is a federal student loan, it falls under all the same things that the unsubsidized loan does. So it does have the six month grace period. It also has the income-based repayment plans. Um, and what we suggest for students to, once you're finally done, like, you know, you're done with school, possibly never going back um, unless, you know, you decide later on is um, to consolidate your loans. Uh, so you can consolidate all your subsidized loans if you have those from the past, your unsubs and your grad pluses uh, to get one locked in, you know, interest rate, one uh, monthly payment as well. So there's definitely options. Um, of course, there's also private loans. Um, available uh, to students if you are interested in that. Um, we have some of that information too up on our website. Um, of course, we don't necessarily encourage students to take out any uh, private student loans. The main reason is because the federal student loans uh, do fall under uh, the forgiveness plans, the federal forgiveness plans, whereas the others do not. <clears throat> so, I did see, oh yeah, sorry. I did see a question pop up, but it was answered. <laughs> right. Okay, great, Amanda. All right, so yes. Yeah. Applying for the federal student aid. Yeah, so the, the FAFSA. Um, so if you had, in the past, again, um, received federal student aid or possibly even Pell Grant, which might be something that you had received in uh, undergrad. Unfortunately, it is only for undergrad uh, students. Um, then you probably filled out the FAFSA. Um, so again, the FAFSA is a free application for federal student aid. Um, go directly to the FAFSA site uh, is what we recommend. There are other sites out there that may charge you um, to actually file your FAFSA for you. Don't just don't don't do that. Um, it's just, it's not necessary. But if you go out there, you fill out the FAFSA, um, this is an annual process. So yes, as you continue through your program, you'll have to complete a new FAFSA every year. 
um, just like you'll have to complete a new graduate plus loan too every year. Um, just make sure that our school code is on it, which is provided right there. Um, and for the incoming fall students, you'd want to complete a 2021-2022 FAFSA, um, which will be based off of your 2019 taxes. And uh, since it is two years prior now, it used to be only one. Um, so it's been kind of confusing um, for people, but Department of Ed has um, more recently changed that to doing two years back. You will, though, as you're completing your FAFSA, um, answer the questions as you are now, if that makes sense. Um, so for example, if you are married now, if you recently got married in either 2020 or 2021, but were not married when you filed taxes in 2019, you do need to still put on your FAFSA that you are married and you will need to include your spouse's income. Uh, that being said, at the graduate level, um, financial aid is not based on need. So it doesn't matter what your income level is. Um, kind of the running joke for us in financial aid is even Oprah would qualify for a federal student loan. So it doesn't, income does not matter. Um, so you just, for the filing of it though, uh, FAFSA does require that you put in, in your spouse's income. Um, where of course, if you didn't file taxes in 2019, uh, just hit will file or not filing. <clears throat> Those are options as well. I'm sorry, yes, next slide. This one? Uh, the All right, so once two. you've completed the FAFSA, um, the next two steps to receiving financial aid is the entrance counseling um, and your master promissory notes. Um, and both of those are completed out on the same website as the FAFSA. Um, so it's completed out on you know, Federal Student Aid, which is the Department of Education site. Uh, it can take up to five days for the school to receive your FAFSA. It can also take up five days from when you submit to receive these other items as well. Uh, but they will be sent to us automatically um, on your behalf. Sorry about that, everybody. Just one moment. Let us let me get us caught back up. If you missed anything, this is what you missed. <laughs> Fielding scholarships, external scholarships, funding options. And now we're at federal student loans in the application process. Sorry about that scroll. Okay, is this where we left off, Amanda? Uh, yes, yes, this would be the next step. Um, so once you have, a, you know, we've received your FAFSA, you've completed your items, which uh, as you can see here, there's a, a checklist, um, and you log into uh, Fielding's Web Advisor self-service portal um, for financial aid, you will see this. And uh, it is our checklist. So even if you didn't have, uh, you know, the MPN in there or your entrance counseling received, it would show you right here. Um, and there are there would be links provided um, to go out and complete them. Um, and then once all of that's been received and we've packaged your loan funding, again, you would log in here and we'd send an email notification letting you know that it's ready. Um, you would log in here, click on the review ex and accept your financial aid award package. Uh, that will take you to the page to review uh, the cost of attendance, your tuition and fees, what you are scheduled to receive, um, and how it is going to be divided uh, between the terms of your attendance. Uh, and right there, you could either accept the loan amount, you could decline the loan amount, or you could um, adjust the loan amount as well. Um, something to note on that, uh, when you get to that other page too, you will see that the loans are divided between the, um, for traditional uh, programs, three terms. So um, you do have to maintain your know, satisfaction academic progress. You do have to continue to uh, register and enroll and attend, um, of course, to be eligible to receive financial aid. So even though you are approved for the amount for the entire year, so you'll, you'll see that, that say your loan is, you know, the full 20,500 and you got another, you know, graduate plus loan to equal say just 30,000 for the year. Um, it will be 
as equally divided as possible between the three scheduled terms of attendance and the funding will come through um, each term. It doesn't come in all in one lump sum in the beginning of the year. Uh, like I said, you have to maintain um, eligibility for it throughout the year, but it'll be approved. It will be scheduled um, the entire amount for the whole year um, and then just come in in the pieces. And then, like I said, it is an annual process, so you will have to renew it um, next year. So it'd be about this time uh, next year for uh, fall students. Um, we do send out email uh, reminders to everyone with all the links provided uh, when it is time to renew your loans. Thank you so much, Amanda. So if you're all wondering what are my next steps, uh, you, if you have questions and you'd like to connect with a financial aid team member, you can email finaid at fielding.edu. You can give them a call or you can schedule an appointment at a time that works best for you. All of their names are listed here. You see Amanda and Lillian, who she mentioned earlier, as well as their contact information on this page. And also continue joining us for the last two events of our virtual open house. Part four is an opportunity to share how you're feeling. We understand you might have a range of emotions at the stage of your higher education journey. So let us know if you're feeling ex excited, prepared, or apprehensive about anything. The whole admissions team will be there to address your questions. Also keep in mind, part five will be a dedicated Q&A for each program with a panel of current students. The program directors and your admissions advisor will be there to support you with any questions as well.